not contributing to the science is the equivalent of a sandcastle because eventually the water will come and wash it away and there'll be no evidence at all of what you did. Could it be that that's, that that's where we're just destined to be? Hello, welcome back to my channel. My name is Emily. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a first year, sorry, I just finished first year of medical school and now I'm at Mayo Clinic for a summer research internship. This is gonna be a little bit of a different video than I usually do. I got the opportunity to interview my PI, Dr. Biden, a world-renowned neurosurgeon specializing in spine surgery, and I think he has a lot of insight, and I wanted to share it with you guys because I know many of you following me are pre-med or interested in becoming a physician, you're in medicine, so wherever you are along the path, I think this will be good. He's very accomplished, went to undergrad at Dartmouth, medical school at Yale then he did residency and fellowship at Johns Hopkins he's worked hard to get to where he is today he has a very 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 long list of accomplishments so I won't say them all you can look on his on his website at Mayo Clinic I hope you enjoy let's get right into it thank you so much for taking the time to do this with me today my pleasure so I've seen videos online talking about your stem cell therapy research and your AI and groundbreaking awesome things that you're doing. But I wanted to ask you about your journey. Can you take us back from when you were a pre-med to how you got here today? So um, thank you and it's great to have you here, uh, Emily. So, you know, a few things. Uh, undergraduate, I was at Dartmouth and then I did a post back at okay. Johns Hopkins afterwards. And I did the vast majority of uh, science classes and um, uh, the math classes needed for medical school um, at Johns Hopkins. I applied to medical school and went to Yale. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the intervening years after my post back in the year that I was applying, I did uh, research uh, at the University of Michigan uh, Cancer Center in uh, oh. stem cell uh, research mm -hmm. there at their stem cell center which at the time was an earlier field than what it is uh, today. And then um, went to Yale and, uh, uh, and there I became very interested in uh, specifically neurosurgery and, and did research in a laboratory focused on uh, familial aneurysms. Okay. Specifically, so aneurysms of the brain and how they can run in families, along with other vascular diseases, was involved in, you know, the genetic analysis of those, and even in finding those families, some of which were from New Orleans, and even flying down there, drawing blood, um, wow. flying back with the blood samples, you know, that type of uh, work, and uh, and that work at the time was very small. I got exposure to a multitude of different areas within. Uh, neurosurgery was, you know, a very positive experience from my standpoint. Uh, then I uh, went to Johns Hopkins for my residency. Uh, you should know that my brother is also a neurosurgeon, and that's oh, yes. a big impact for me. There's uh, many of us who have brothers in neurosurgery. Okay. So my brother is a neurosurgeon. He's uh, seven years older than me. His pathway also to neurosurgery was a big impact for me. He did his fellowship at Johns Hopkins and then stayed as faculty. Okay. And I went to Johns Hopkins for training and residency. And uh, I did my uh, residency there. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was an extraordinary program uh, for neurosurgery. When I went to Johns Hopkins, I, I thought I would be a vascular neurosurgeon, treating aneurysms, treating AVMs, treating cavernomas. Oh. Uh, but there was a, a larger than life figure who led spine surgery there, who continues to be my mentor to this day. He, uh, his name is Diego Coslin, and led the spine program there. Henry Brem was the chair. The two of them, you know, with both their guidance, transitioned towards spinal surgery, proceeded to do my training. I did my fellowship with Zia, and then came to Mayo Clinic, where I've been for 10 years. Wow. It seems like you've had a lot of mentor figures kind of guiding your path. Were you inspired by your brother to get into neurosurgery in the first place? Yeah, by my brother being a neurosurgeon, definitively. You know, I still remember seeing surgeries with him and things like that oh. as a pre-med student and as, as med student and things of that nature. So definitely a, a big inspiration. And then other mentors, Murat Ganel, who'd been at Yale, uh, Zia Kostin at Johns Hopkins, Henry Graham at Johns Hopkins, people here that I've gotten to work with. You'll see that throughout your career, including at the student level, different people will have influences upon you 
and you know, to the point that I thought I was going to do vascular because I was doing research in vascular. Yeah. And then I saw spinal surgery and I thought, well, wait, this is really neat. Mm -hmm. So it, it's altering. So let's say I'd gone to Johns Hopkins and just to show you kind of the small things that could have changed things. Let's just say I'd gone to Johns Hopkins and rather than, you know, uh, Zia being a spinal surgeon, let's just say he did something else, brain tumors very likely I would be doing brain tumors today. And so those kinds of things alter, shape, shift, make you think about things differently. You know, I remember one brain tumor surgeon at Yale, at, uh, Joe Peepmeyer is an exceptional surgeon and, and, and also another person who was a mentor to me. And he said, you know what's amazing about brain tumor surgery? I said, what? He said, uh, and I don't even know that he would recall this, but as a medical student, it, it really imprinted on me. He was taking out a brain tumor and he said, I want you to go stand at the door. So I went and stood at the door of the OR. So I'm very far away from where he was. And he said, does it look like my instruments are even moving? And it didn't. I said, no, it doesn't. And he said, now come close, come into the microscope. Yeah. And I came close, he goes, now are they moving? I said, it looks like they're really moving. <laughs> And he said that, so that's, you know, that was really neat uh, to me. And I've always kind of gravitated towards gadgets, newer things. And so that's why, you know, for me, minimally invasive, robotic, those types of approaches became very appealing. Did you always know that research would be such a big part of your medical career? One trend over time that I always think through is you, you know, obviously you want to do a great job every day, but there was one uh, professor of neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins who always said, not contributing to the science is the equivalent of a sandcastle because eventually the water will come and wash it away and there'll be no evidence at all of what you did. You could come do great work. You could come do something very beautiful in the sand, but the water's gonna wash it away. If you wanna cement it and make it permanent and have it be something that someone can later come to and look at, then you have to do science. That's what advances the field. That's what makes things better. And you see kind of from how I've set up my lab, how important that is to me. So today at Mayo Clinic, I'm a practicing neurosurgeon. I have a busy uh, surgical schedule, surgical load, mm -hmm. mostly focused on robotics and minimally invasive spine surgery. At the same time, scientifically, I run a laboratory mm -hmm. and there's three components to science. There's basic science, generally bench studies, right? Wet bench studies. Translational science is clinical trials. And then there's clinical science, which is, or clinical studies, clinical research. And you see, I have all three of those focused on spine, basic science for spinal cord injury or spinal degeneration, translational science with clinical trials for spinal cord injury or other areas of uh, spinal surgery. And then clinical science, where we do a lot of our AI work, our uh, data science work, a lot of that lives there. I think those three areas are equally important. And it's one of the unique features of the neuroinformatics lab that I established here at Mayo. Can you comment on your stress levels as a neurosurgeon? Our specialty is, is it's a hard specialty, neurosurgery. It's, it's intense. Even the, the slow moments have an intensity to them. Yeah. There's, there's a pace to it. There's a stress to it. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, Dr. Ben Carson, who is at Johns Hopkins, I'm not commenting on the politics at all uh, for the purposes of, of this video, um, uh, but he ran for president. Mm -hmm. And he came back to Johns Hopkins after he ran for president. And I remember I asked him, your run for president versus you know, being a neurosurgeon. Mm -hmm. and, and, and he said, he made a comment that I thought was so extraordinary, which is, well, it's not as stressful as um, being a neurosurgeon. And, and he said he never appreciated how much, even though it was a low level of stress that was just always there. Mm -hmm. Because you're dealing with people's lives, right? And you're dealing with high impact. So I don't know that I knew it was there until he made that comment. And that's another comment just in conversation, yeah. but, it, but it sticks with you. But I thought, yeah, you know, that, that's correct. Because eventually at some point you, you get used to that. Mm -hmm. And so just like anyone who has to do something, you know, who has to, you know, do A to Z every day. But, but there's a lack of predictability. You're taking call, you don't know what's gonna come in. Mm -hmm. and, and other surgeons have that too, right? And other, the medical proceduralists and the internal medicine doctors and, and all of that. What drives you? Like, how do you stay on top of everything? You know, obviously it's an area that's important to me. And it's something that for me is, you know, uh, you know, kind of the highest priority because people used to undergo surgery and everybody used to die. And then we got anesthetic, but then everybody got an infection. And mm -hmm. so many people died of the infections. And then we got antibiotics 
medicine has advanced in a sequential way. And what a shame it would be to see that stop. It would never stop because of this culture, right? Because of people who want to study, want to do more, want to answer questions uh, that, that today don't have answers. Every specialty has unmet needs, particularly in nurse surgery, more than in others. Um, and, and the goal of research should be to address the unmet need that isn't theirs. I posted on my Instagram story, I was like, do you guys have any questions for a neurosurgeon? One of the big ones was, how do you balance like family and, yeah. and career, especially in neurosurgery? Sure, sure. So I'm very fortunate. Uh, my wife's an attorney, but we just had our 20 year anniversary, our 20 year Congrats. anniversary. Yeah, so that's it's awesome. been, yeah, and, it, and that's been a real, you know, most important thing in my life is mm -hmm. my family. So that's, you know, my parents, my family, my wife, my children. And, um, and they're in school, they're young. Um, and so obviously, you know, you have to set aside time, work-life balance. I don't know that that was the best for me, in all honesty, for many different years. Mm -hmm. and, and there's certain times where, you know, you're a resident and you're, you know, I remember a, a 72 hour period in particular, where I was home so little, and yet, you know, my family was very supportive. And I remember thinking, this cannot be normal. You know? <laughs> but I think it's a little better. Now, well, it was worse for the people who came before me. Mm. And, and it's, it's better for the people now than it was for me. So it keeps getting better and better. But, you know, I think it's obviously spending time with your family, your children, is really critically important. And we've had a lot of really good, you know, things together. 20 years ago, did you imagine you would be where you are no. today? No, definitely not. Definitely not. You know, it's so funny, a patient of mine, uh, you know, won a Hall of Fame award for NASCAR and I got to go with him. Uh, and, and he was telling me during a race, there's so many little things that occur that drive who, the, who ends up, you know, being one of the top, you know, 10 people in the race or who ends up having crashed and not having finished the race at all. And, and I've taken care of enough, you know, sports players and things like that, where, where that's the case in a lot of areas. You know, there's so many things that you look at where one or two critical decisions could have resulted in a completely different outcome. And it's the same, it'll be the same in your career. You're gonna, you're gonna have forks in the road, so many of them, and then you could envision, well, you, I mean, you could play it as a mind game, well, what if I go back and what if I would taken that fork in the road instead of this fork in the road? And, and so many of those could have resulted in maybe you not even going to medical school, yeah. you not coming here, you, you know, I mean, us meeting and you, you know, we're here in my lab now, what, where does that take you in, in 10? What does that mean? I, I would say though, the formative experiences all guided towards, you know, steps that needed to occur, so to speak. And so they all, yeah. they, you know, I can see now when I go back on those, kind of the stepping stones of, you know, those various things. This might be a, a hard question. Was there one specific fork in the road, stepping stone, that stands out to you, like to get you where you are today? It's hard to say. And yeah. so many of my decisions also have been consultative with my wife, mm -hmm. with my family, with uh, my parents, mm -hmm. with my mentors. And and so I've been fortunate to have good advice, but in all honesty, let's say I didn't listen to it. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, <is> that, <laughs> yeah. Would that have been something totally different? I, I, I don't know. Okay. You know, I don't know, but, um, but, but I, I'm glad I listened to it where I sit today. <laughs> But if you were to go back and play out, you know, the thousand scenarios of if you didn't and the different things that that would have resulted in, you know, um, uh, you, you know, it, it's hard to say. Yeah. yeah, it's very hard to say. You so. can really drive yourself down a rabbit hole thinking yes. about that. Yeah, yeah, no, no, absolutely. But I think you, I think the general, so go back, you know, again to that higher view, the general trajectory that you want right your md to be right hard, yeah. so your md to be so the general so you've already made the decision to be a doctor which you know people impact you know humanity in positive ways in all sorts of professions you've chosen medicine right so now it's you know the paths right you got to think through medical medical procedural surgical big or micro right you got to think through all of that yourself and then you know make a path down those or do you go down an epidemiological path and it's completely different or do you become a consultant and it's completely different? So there's so many different ways that you could sort of think through this. Uh, but in all of those, you could have a very significant uh, impact, obviously. Mm, a lot of options. A lot of options. <laughs> a lot of options. 
How about 20 years from now? Where do you see yourself and where do you see the field of yeah. neurosurgery? I'd, I'd like to see it where you take a brain tumor, your GBM, our, our biggest killer of a brain tumor uh, in neurosurgery. And with GBM, the mortality rate, you know, was nine months, oh, wow. I think 20 years ago. Then it was 12 months, and maybe it's 15, 16 months now. But it hasn't, that's not a radical shift, I would say. You know, I mean, that's, you, you would think over decades and decades and billions of dollars poured into research, mm -hmm. you know? So there's other diseases that I treat that are like that, specifically spinal cord injury. Mm -hmm. The first alphabet was the Phoenicians. I mean, just go through back in history. And they actually had a big impact on hieroglyphics which the Egyptians then took on and began Egyptian hydro, uh, 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 hieroglyphics. Mm -hmm. And if you go back to ancient Egyptian textbooks on medicine, which they exist, they're not taught in medical school today, but they exist. Um, and you were to review those, they talk about spinal cord injury. And you know what they say? They say it's a condition not to be treated, the patients don't get better. And then you go to Mixter, which is a famous surgical textbook. And then when you look at what they say about spinal cord injury, it's almost the same thing as what the Egyptians had said, wow. which is you do the surgery and then leave it alone. It's not going to get better. And, you know, kind of extraordinary that over thousands of years, that's where we land. Could it be that that's, that that's where we're just destined to be? My hypothesis is no, there, there probably is a better place to go. Today, we do surgery and we do physical therapy supportive care, but the outcomes are highly variable. Some people do well, some people do not, and, and highly non-standardized. And so what are the things that we could do and that we could impact? You know, the, the many areas of technology that we see that have changed our lives personally, you know, you can order things from home, you, mm -hmm. you, you know, I mean, the, many things. But what are the opportunities for those to impact how we deliver surgery, how we deliver medicine? So all those things, you know, I think are to be determined. But you know the work of people like you, the work of uh, our lab, the work of you know our research. The good news is, it'll it'll either point away and say, hey, we tried it this way, that didn't work, or it'll say, hey, we have a signal here that something's working, and we're going to pursue that. Mm -hmm. And and that'll be extraordinary because in 20 years, that should have some impact. What about yourself? Where do you see yourself personally in 20 years? Yeah, I mean, 20 years, I'd be close to retirement, right? So I'd be, you know, and my career would be winding down by then and, and handing it off to you and handing off to, you know, you wouldn't be MD to be by then. You'll be Hopefully. established MD. You know, it's a long road, but not that long. So you'll be established MD. Um, uh, and, and, you know, handing it off to whoever's next and hopefully they pursue you know, a greater path and everything keeps advancing. One last question for you. Do you have any advice for people who want to follow in your footsteps? Sure. I have a number of uh, students, fellows, you know, people who work with me and, you know, I invest a lot of time in what they do and they invest a lot of time in what they do. And what I would say is um, keep an open mind on exactly the areas that you're gonna focus on and work in. Make sure that you choose the fields where you're gonna be happiest. Stick to it. When you make that choice, stick to it and and focus and, and really you know specialize in it and hone in. Try to impact the highest number that you can. Wh whatever the field is, whether that be infectious disease or whether that be any type of surgery, any surgical subspecialty, cardiac surgery, whatever it is. You'll, you'll learn from a multitude of different people. You'll gain a variety of mentors throughout your career. They will all have an impact on you. And, and slowly you'll build the different aspects that will define what your career looks like. And then in addition, at home, your spouse, your children, whatever your home life looks like, having that be successful, investing time into that, it's the same thing, just you know, on the other side of things. All of that, I think, is really important uh, to having success. Well, thank you so much. I feel like I've learned a lot. I think everyone watching will learn an incredible amount. Yeah, thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you. It's great to see you and be with you. There's Michael, straight chilling. <laughs> That's Costa, one of the research fellows. Who's that? Another one. Oh. <laughs> okay.